getting down and dirty with the Dirty D's. Yeah! This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. And we are dealing with the series called the Dirty D's. Oh yeah, there are a lot of those. Uh, Just to share with you, uh, dealing with these words are the kind of things that can really mess with our lives. They can complicate simple things. They can they can contaminate pure things and they can deviate us off the beaten path. They can uh, steer us away from our focal point, from our destinies. And some of us have missed out on a lot of God's blessings because of a lot of these dirty deeds. I'm going to deal with, I believe, five today, unless God has me bogged down on two or three of them. And we're going to deal with delusional, being delusional, disguise, disguising, however you want to use that word, being in denial, deflection, and the verb called dismiss. Sometimes you feel like people just dismiss what you have to say. All right. Now, let's get down and dirty with the dirty deeds. We will start with the word denial. Let's start with that. No, let's start with disguise. Because that's a lot of things that we do and we don't uh, own up to who we really are. So let's go with disguise. That's one of the dirty deeds. The definition is camouflage, conceal, hide, Cover up, make inconspicuous, mask, shroud. Mm. (laughs) Misrepresent, falsify, give a false picture of. Let's stop right there. Now, one of the things that we don't realize is Every one of us as human beings is innate in our flesh, in our nature, our sinful nature. Even though we're saved, we have to battle these parts of us, these tendencies. And one of the things we have to be careful of is not becoming phony. How you doing, Peter? I see you. (laughs) Not becoming phony. So I want you to think about the times in your life where you misrepresented yourself. You put yourself out there and painted this nice rosy picture. And you know you were dead wrong, but you paint this rosy picture. And maybe you caught yourself mishandling a a conversation. And when you get through telling the story, you have painted yourself as an angel. Oh, you were just in this in this pitiful situation, but you were so angelic. You were wearing all white. You even had a halo around your head. And everything you said was kind. And everything you did was right. And everything they did was wrong. Ha! And we do this when we tell stories of having conflicts with other people. And if we're honest with ourselves, we've all done it from a time or two. Made ourselves look a little extra victimized, a little extra sweet, a little extra innocent. While the other person is demonized and, oh, we paint this ugly picture of them. We villainize them. and. Sometimes the problem that we're dealing with with another person stems from what's really going on in us. But no, we must villainize the other person in order to make ourselves feel better about me. Yes. So those are some of the things. Now, one of the things that that causes is people to pass the buck. We always use that expression, pass the buck. It's like Rashad made me do it. Peter made me do it. The devil made me do it. They made me do it. What they did to me when I was two years old, that's what made me do it. All right. 
So let's go to Genesis. Here's a good example of that. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Oh, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is made of the which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die, ye shall not eat of it. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. <clears throat> For God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be like God's, knowing good and evil. Now, moving on down, because I just want to gloss over this section where we see the beginning of passing the buck. All right. And the and the Lord asked Adam, and I love this because we, you know, we don't see this. When God asks you, where are you? He is not ignorant as to where you are. He knows exactly where you are physically. He knows exactly the location you're in. He knows whose house you're in, whether you're in the car, whether you're at work. He knows that. So trust me, he's all knowing. He does not need to ask you where you are. So when he asked Adam, and the Lord called unto Adam, verse 9, and said unto him, Where art thou? That's a, that's an, oh my goodness, that's a reassessment. Check yourself out. What's happening with you right now? What's wrong with you? Where art thou? <laughs> I love it. And he said, uh, God's continuing to talk. Where art thou? See, when God asks you that question, I got to bog down here just for a minute. When he asks you the question, now it's time, the ball's in your court. Now it's time for you to ante up in total truth, even to yourself. Or you're going to lie. One or the other. You might, as the kids say, misrepresent. You're not going to represent because you don't want to tell the truth on yourself. Anyway, so now we know what he's really asking him. What's going on with you, buddy? All right. And he said, well, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said he wasn't afraid because he was naked, baby. He was afraid because he knew he had done wrong. <laughs> he was exposed. That's what the word naked really means. And he said, who told thee thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? Trust me, God already knew. And the man said, this is the man's response, not yes. He says, the woman whom thou gave me. Now check this out. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now he might as well have said, she held a gun to my head and I had no other choice because she threatened to kill me. It was just that ridiculous. He did not take responsibility for his own actions, for his own decisions. It's her fault. Well, it's really your fault because you the one who gave me, you gave me that woman. That's really what he's saying. Think about that, how he worded that. The woman thou gave to me to be with me. <laughs> he didn't just say the woman, the woman thou gave. You know, we don't realize how we do this, but that's one of the things that makes growth, repentance, change, development, maturity. It really hampers though th that process. And the reason it hinders it is because we will not ante up. We want to paint this picture of ourselves as the victim. When we willingly, knowingly, desiringly did wrong. Not at gunpoint, 
we just did wrong. That's why I always get a little annoyed when I hear the saints say, oh, well, God understands when you make mistakes. It ain't a mistake when we sin, baby. No matter what we do, it's never a mistake. It's a choice. It's a conscious choice. But calling it a mistake makes it not feel so my faultish. Mm -hmm. And we go through life doing that. There are marriages that don't do well because the husband blames the wife and the wife blames the husband. And nobody's taking responsibility for their, for themselves. The husband doesn't take responsibility for his foul attitude, his impatience, his intolerance, his tendency to be judgmental. She, the woman, is not taking responsibility. Think about this. I know some of you see it. Some of you live this. The woman isn't taking responsibility for where she falls short. Everything is his fault. Everything's the kid's fault. Everything's the money's fault or the lack thereof. Not her fault. Never her fault. Never his fault. So the twain never meet in the middle. They never meet in that middle ground of reconciliation, true reconciliation, because they're too busy pointing the finger at each other. And nobody is looking at the man in the mirror. Hmm. All right. So we dealt with disguise. Now let's move on to delusion. You ever hear people say they believe their own press? Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm going to read what Webster says about delusion, being delusional. Characterized by or holding idiosyncratic beliefs of impressions that are contradicted by reality or rational argument, typically as a symptom of mental disorder. Hospitalization for schizophrenia and delusional paranoia. He was diagnosed with a disillusional disorder. That's just the sentence it uses as an example. You ever hear people say, baby, you so dis you so delusional it's like, get a grip on reality. Come out of fantasy land, y'all. You can't live your life playing like everything is fine, like you're fine, like, like there's nothing wrong and, and, and everything about you is right. And, and you have these these uh, delusions of grandeur. You, you think you're all that and a hundred bag of chips and, and a, a, anything that goes wrong is never on you. So you're in self-denial. You're delusional because you're painting this phony picture of yourself. You don't know who you are and you definitely don't want them to know who you really are. The part of you that you do know, you don't want them to see that. So you paint a whole different picture and you play a role. Hi, how are you? Oh, it's so nice seeing you. Yes, that's a nice outfit you have on. And in your mind, you're wondering, what trash can did you take that crap up from? You, you got all this little sarcasm going on in your head, but your mouth is speaking nice, flowery words. Why? Because you want them to think that you're such a wonderful person. You're Mr. Wonderful. You're Miss Wonderful. Oh, so wonderful. Oh, yes, you are. Mm -hmm. Butter wouldn't even melt in your mouth because you are just so phenomenal. Mm. My, my, my. So unbelieving. So unbelievable. What a rare breed for you to be that wonderful of an individual. But that is the picture you paint of yourself. That's the portrayal that you put forth for the world to see. You put on your mask. You put on your costume. You you adopt a certain stance, a certain stature. You speak a certain way. 
And you are just amazing. Everybody is awed by you. Wow. And they don't know what a, 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 a Grinch you are. They don't know what a grump you are. They don't know how controlling and manipulative you are. They don't know what a liar you are. Yeah. They don't know how conniving and how scheming you are, how underhanded you are. They don't know what a backstabber you are. They don't know that. Because you've painted such a glorious picture of yourself. So that everyone will love you. Everyone will like you. Everyone will take to you. They'll be drawn to you. Well, see, in the Bible it says Satan is the father of lies. It doesn't say it like that. It says God is not the father of lies. So the rest of that statement would mean Satan is. Because God is all about truth. And listen, if you have God all in you, you're going to be seeking the truth about yourself. Lord, show me myself. And when you talk to other people, you're going to be real with them. You're going to be honest with them. Even about your faults, your weaknesses, your frailties, your failings. You're going to be real because you're not trying to impress. You're just trying to be real. You know God knows who you are more than you do. So you're not trying to be phony. But some of you are. And that is where we get to delusional. Because it's one thing to be phony. But it's another thing to believe your own lie. It's another thing to fall for your own front. Mm -hmm. And you believe, you look in the mirror and you believe that butter never melts in your mouth. Oh no, butter won't melt in your mouth because you're such a wonderful, marvelous, glorious person. <laughs> How could you even think? Something like that about me. <laughs> really? Yeah. And you get highly indignant because you have become delusional. The second dirty D for today. Now let's move on to a third dirty D. These are all words that start with D if you wonder where the dirty D comes from. Denial. Did we deal with that? Yes. We dealt with delusional, disguised, denial. Ah, here's the, I love this one. Deflection. You ever watch people in sports <clears throat> and they, they, they get the ball to you and you deflect it somewhere else because you, you know, like in volleyball, volleyball. All right. In volleyball, when they, uh, bump the ball, and then they set, and the other person sets it up with the tip of their fingers. And another person comes to run to smash it. They want to slam it down. Spike it is the word. Over the net. So it goes down real fast. So the other team, the opponent, the opposing team, cannot uh, retrieve and, and return the shot. But somebody is liable to deflect it at least off the ground so that someone else can get to it and get it over the net. Now, we do this in arguments, confrontation, heated discussion, interaction with people on our job. And somebody might want to show you something that could have been done in a better way. And instead of you listening to good counsel or good advice, you get defensive. And that's where deflection comes in at. You get defensive. You go into denial and you become, you, you want to disguise what's going on. So you deflect and you tell the person, you know, 
I really have to get on, on my, my staff's case because I know that these guys are not doing their job right. If they did their job right, I would be able to do this better. And I don't have time to deal with this. Let me get over here and talk to them. Now, the person was trying to share with you what you did wrong, but you didn't want to hear it. So you deflect. And you change the whole direction of that conversation and send it to a whole different direction. Then you pass the buck and point the finger, passing the blame on someone else. You know it was your fault, but you don't want them to know that you know it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So you keep it under wraps and you deflect. See, these are the things that hinder us from growing. We don't realize how we literally short circuit our own development. We stifle ourselves with the dirty deeds. All right. Let's move on to dismiss. This won't be long. Let's move on to dismiss. Now, a lot of us don't do this. Not everybody does this. But there are people who tend to be narcissistic arrogant, full of themselves, full of pride. Pride cometh before a fall and a haughty heart before destruction. That's word. All right. So you're dealing with a person like that. And what ends up happening? If I'm talking to you about something you know, where we need to try to change the plan or come up with a better way of doing something, a better strategy. And I saw something on the internet and these guys are so successful and I think this would be a great idea for us to adopt in our business. And you literally dismiss what I have to say. Uh, Pat, um, Thank you very much, but I I, I, I got something I got to do. <laughs> you didn't hear a word. You didn't care to hear it. You just dismissed. It's called disregard. If Lynn and I are having a discussion about something and Lynn is sharing her ideas or an experience she had. I just got through burning her ear for 30 minutes about what happened to me today. And she starts talking about herself and what happened to her. And I, I, and, and I cut it short and said, girl, I got to get me some coffee. What time is it? Oh, okay. I'll call you tomorrow. And she's like, well, I was right in the middle of a sentence. What I really told her, in essence, is I don't want to hear it. I said what I got to say. Conversation's over as far as I'm concerned. That's how we dismiss people. You have your, your mother, your sister, your daughter, your father, your cousin, your brother, your uncle, trying to explain something to you. And you tell them, oh, that's not important. Anyway, I got to go do something. Uh, I'll, I'll be back. You know, you know, we'll cover that later. How do you think that makes people feel? It makes them feel insignificant. It does emotional damage. Peter's trying to tell me about his weekend, how wonderful it was, all the ministry that took place, all that he was learning and observing. And I cut him short. And say, uh, what you going to have for dinner tonight? I'm trying to think of what I want to eat. Conversations back on me. And he, he was right in the middle of the drama, the part that he really loved, a, a real dramatic, climactic part of the story. I don't want to hear it. I cut him short because I'm thinking about food. It's all about me. That's being dismissive. That's treating other people with disregard. There are people to this day, I do not engage in long conversations because I already know 
once they get through saying what they have to say, and I start to open my mouth to contribute to the conversation, the conversation will be cut because they're done. They don't want to hear what you had to say. They're done. They're happy with what they had to say because they like to hear themselves talk. Those are things in human nature that we don't realize goes on. It's interactive, but it's very destructive. Mm. And in those ways, using those forms uh, or the lack thereof of communication, we are telling people over and over again, what you have to say doesn't matter to me. What you did today, I really could care less. All I needed you to do, it's like telling, it's like telling Rashad, Rashad, now you just sit there. Because I got something I want to talk about and I need an ear. I need an audience. Blah, 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 blah. I did this. I did that. Yakety yak, yakety yak. <laughs> and then Rashad starts to interject and I'm like, okay, what time is it? Oh, I got to go. Why? I didn't call to interact with Rashad. I called because I want to hear myself talk. And it only makes sense for somebody to be on the other end of the phone or across the table. That's the arrogance that says I am all important. Everything I've got to say is important, but I ain't got time for you and your little, yeah, whatever, whatever. Get your name wrong, whatever. People do it to each other all the time. I just ask you to pay attention to what you're doing. Don't treat people that way. That's not love. And I'm going to end. Let's go from the dirty D's to the loving, beautiful, glorious love. And I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we are done. That will be in closing. 1 Corinthians 13. <clears throat> This is what we lovingly refer to as the love chapter because charity is love. All right. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as blah, 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 sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. You know, they say empty cans make a lot of noise. All right, moving right along. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not puffed up. Or we could say is not narcissistic. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, let me add, way. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. What you say to me? Thinketh no evil. Uh huh. Rejoices not in iniquity. Ooh, did you hear? <laughs> but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood it as, as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away 
childish things. Including the dirty deeds, may I add. Mm. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now about it, faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity, is love. God bless you.